Hello, everyone. What do a marathon runner, an Amazon package, and data all have in common? They all have to go through what is called the last mile. Has anyone here ran a marathon before? Hands up. Okay, yeah, we have a few marathon runners. Actually, my hand should not be up because I actually do not like running myself. But a marathon is 26 miles. And that last mile is always the hardest because that's when your strength and your will are absolutely sapped. And you need to dig deep down to find that last breath and finish strong. But again, that's something I wouldn't know. But maybe more of you can relate to this one. Now, how many of you have ordered an Amazon package in the last month? Yeah, definitely so many more of you. More likely than not, it was delivered through one of these vans that you see all around the city. But it was not always like this. Despite Amazon's flawless supply chains and finely tuned warehouses, Amazon itself had a problem to solve. How do we get that the right package to the right address and the right time? And this is called the last mile in logistics. And Amazon's operations of these vans is their solution to the last mile. And finally, data. Up until we communicate data, there are so many hard skills that every single one of us here are part of. Everything from data engineering, statistical analysis, business intelligence. But none of this has any value unless we take action on it. And this gap between seeing the data and taking action is called the last mile in data analytics. I'm Adrian, and I have over 10 years of data storytelling experience as an engineer in oil and gas and digital banking products. And while I've analyzed and visualized a lot of data in my career, I've been on this ongoing journey to find out what makes people tick, how to get them to take action in this last mile of data. And throughout my career, the biggest challenge I find is simply getting people to agree on something. And usually, getting human beings rowing together will get you more results than any advanced mathematical model that you build. And usually, the best use of your time is in basic analytics, metrics that you can put together that tell what happened in the past and just getting people to agree on that without any complex modeling. And today, I'll be talking, how do we actually craft this metric using elements of story? Demonstrate how a single number can hold so much impact and power. And also, how do we level up this metric to tell even more powerful stories? Now, for centuries, stories were how our ancestors pass on lessons to us and entertain us. And every single day, we are surrounded by stories. In the books that we read, the TV shows and movies that we watch, the video games that we play, and yes, even in data. And every single story has these very common elements. And the first one is the protagonist. This is the hero or the character we are all sharing for. Next, they need a goal because the hero is not where they want to be. By the end of the story, they always want to be in a better spot. Every story also has an antagonist. The characters that are preventing our hero from reaching that goal. Finally, every story needs an audience because does the story really exist if there's nobody there to hear it and take action? Now, let's apply these to a metric. So, I define a metric as two numbers, a numerator and a denominator. Very simple. You divide one by the other, and you get either a ratio or a percentage. But why is this ratio more powerful than each of these numbers by themselves? 
Well, you can actually think of each of these numbers as the protagonist and the antagonist of the story. And this single number, moving up or down, represents a struggle between the two. And as human beings, it is a struggle inside the story that compels us. Stories like David versus Goliath, Queen Rhaenyra versus King Aegon, Mario versus Bowser, Numerator versus Denominator. Now, let's dive into each one of these. So, your numerator is like that protagonist in the story. We care about the, their development over time. We love to see them go up and to the right. Think about that impact that you, your team, or your project are looking to have on your business or your clients. And usually that in some way is either increasing revenue or decreasing cost. As a data scientist, your impact sometimes doesn't usually lie within the data you work with. Just this past talk, we saw that computer imaging, as a data scientist, you look at a lot of that data, but ultimately, the impact is looking to save time or cost in the medical industry. If you're a production engineer in oil and gas, your impact is the amount of oil you make. Very simple. More oil, more money. If you were a product manager, that number could be the number of users on your app. This could be an increase in revenue if you're a SaaS company and, and users are paying, or it could be a decrease in cost. If your app is a digital version of a physical experience, like in a bank. Now, just like the protagonist, data by itself is actually not very interesting unless you have context. For example, if I told you that I had 10,000 users on my app this month, it's probably very meaningless to most of you because none of you work on my app. That's like saying, hey, here's Mario. He just exists, right? He doesn't really have any purpose. He's not a very interesting character. Now, by adding that antagonist to your story, this is what creates color in your character. And this is how stories are created. And sometimes the best stories are simply comparing to yourself. You are the antagonist, seeing where you came from. For example, if we had 8,000 user apps on our app last month, you can tell that story of growth. All these improvements on your product all the efforts in marketing and sales are leading to this increase. But the story suddenly changes if we had 13,000 users on our app last month. Now you're suddenly telling that story, a completely different story of churn. Why are these users not coming back to our app? Let's look at another metric. This one is an acquisition. The number of people that sign up for my app. And let's see how this story changes, depending on what we compare this number to. The first one we can always compare it to is the number of app downloads. And this is what we call a conversion rate. And this metric tells the story of friction in your sign-up process. So from when somebody clicks download in the app store to when they sign up, is it very seamless? Is it just one or two clicks, like the sign up with Google or Facebook button that you see? Or is there an incredibly long form where you need to manually type in all that information? After they sign up, do they simply open your app? And this is what we call an activation rate. And this number tells that story of received value. Once your users sign up, do they see enough value to open it up? And you'd actually be surprised how many people sign up and never actually open the app. Also compare our app signups with the number of valuable actions. Are they actually doing anything valuable? And this is what we call an engagement rate. And this tells a different story altogether. The one of customer value. Are your customers actually getting value out of your app? Now, let's move on to the oil and gas world. Now, when we defined our protagonist, it was simply the amount, no, the amount of oil that we made. Very simple. More oil. More money. 
Now, let's see how the story changes depending on what we compare this number with. Now, in Alberta, we have lots of heavy oil. And trying to get it out of the ground is like trying to drink peanut butter from a straw. <laughs> so, what we do instead is we put steam in the ground. And when we do that, it melts the oil, so it flows more like water and less like peanut butter, and it makes it much more drinkable. So, one thing that we compare it to, the amount of oil we, we get out, is simply the amount of steam we put in. In the industry, this is called the oil-steam ratio, or OSR. And this number tells the story of how effective that process is of steam melting the oil. And this one is important if your audience is reservoir engineers, because we care about the effectiveness of the steam. Right? We want to always get more oil with less steam. Now, when we get oil of the ground, that's not the only thing that comes out. We also get a lot of water, too. And in this case, uh, we get a water-oil ratio in the industry. And this number tells the story of our production quality. Not only reservoir engineers are interested in this, but also your plant and process engineers as well. So they are the ones that are looking to deal with the water. But in the end, we all want that higher production quality. More oil, less water. You can also compare the amount of oil we make with operations cost. And in industry, this is what we call the lifting cost. And this number tells the story of efficiency. How efficient are your operations? And this is the number that we want to tell, and the story that we want to tell to operations managers, because they care about getting the most oil on the ground for the least amount of money spent. Now, so far, we've only just added one antagonist to our story. And I've demonstrated how I can create many different stories from that same number. But let's level this up by continuously adding context and show how we can actually tell more powerful stories and get by it at different levels. And to demonstrate, I'm going to use uh, what we call in banking a self-serve transaction. And to help you understand what this means, I'm going to use the example of paying your bills. You know, those ridiculously expensive utility bills we've had this past few months? Now, who paid their bill online? Yeah, most of you. Now, who actually went into the branch to pay their bill? Not many people. Now, the choice to use the digital version is called a self-serve transaction. And the same applies when you go out to eat with your friends and somebody pays the entire tab. Do you pay your friend back using e-transfer or do you go into a branch and take out cash to pay them back? And for a bank, this actually matters a lot because it costs a lot less to serve clients that use our app than those that come to a branch. And our goal is to always have more people use the app. Now, I told you we had 100,000 self-serve transactions on our app. Again, probably a very meaningless number to most of you, because we've essentially defined the hero without any villains. Now, let's compare this with the total number of transactions that were done at our bank. So now we're including those that were done at the branch as well. Now, that number becomes 92%. And this number, this 92% tells a much better story that this is actually how our customers prefer to send money. And this is important because this 92% tells a better story. It makes more sense to all of you than this 100,000. Now, let's level this up and let's just say compare this 92% with our regional competitors. How are they, how are they doing? And to say that we are actually number four compared to our competitors, because they are at 93, 94, 95%. And this metric now becomes a rank. But the story turns into that of competition. And when that story changes to competition, we suddenly have the attention of senior executives in your company. They might not care about the 100,000 
or the 92%. But being ranked four gets their eyes and their ears. Now, let's level this up one more time, and let's compare this region with the entire country. How is our region doing? And let's say it turns out that our region is actually number one in the entire country. Now, you can probably get the attention of the CEO themselves, and you can help them tell that story of how this 100,000 is amongst the best of the best to the investors. Goals and benchmarks are how we write the endings to the story. And to demonstrate this, I'm going to use these three metrics that we were uh, using to measure at. Now, if I had to tell you, you have to pick one of these metrics that was problematic to focus on, which one would it be? Um, so who would say conversion rate looks problematic? Activation rate? Engagement rate. Okay, well, lots of people say engagement rate. And right now, this is actually a trick because this is actually poor data storytelling. What now? And now, you can actually see it's a little more obvious where we want to focus. The endings for activation engagement have already been written. And there actually isn't much of the story you want to tell here anymore. Although, we should always be on the lookout for the sequel. Conversion rate, on the other hand, it's not where we want to be. And while it looked like we were winning for a while, that protagonist is now in the deadlock with the villain. And this is actually where we want to focus our analytical efforts, our storytelling, and our action. Finally, knowing your audience. And today, I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment and get to know you, my audience, and your movie preferences. So, first of all, hands up if you love movies. And I assume everyone loves movies, so everyone should have your hand up. All right. And actually, if you do not like movies, put your hand down. So, okay. so everyone keep your hands up. OK, so I'm going to name movie genres. And if you do not like that movie genre, put your hand down. So action movies. If you do not like action movies, hands down. OK, a couple hands down. If you do not like comedy, put your hand down. OK, uh, now out of those who still have your hands up, if you do not like horror movies, put your hand down. Yeah, this is where my hand goes down to. I hate horror movies. <laughs> uh, romantic, hands down. Uh, science fiction or fantasy. Um, musical, hands down. Sports, martial arts, western, and drama. Okay, so if you look around, most people probably still do not have their hand up, and that's okay. There might be a few movie buffs that had their hand up throughout because they love all types of movies. But that is because every movie genre appeals to somebody different. You can imagine if they tried to make an action comedy, science fiction, romantic, thriller, mystery, western sports movie, that it would be a complete mess. And nobody would get anything out of it. Your data could be doing the same thing if you do not have an audience to find for your story. Data scientists, product managers, engineers, marketing, executives, we all care about very, very different things. And just like a movie genre, if you can target your story with the right audience, that's how you get the emotional buy-in. If you manage to sleep through this entire presentation, or if all my analogies were simply too silly and everything went over your head, then I just want you to remember one thing today. And that is that fewer metrics and deeper stories connected with the right people are key to driving action in the last mile of data. There is simply too much data in the world today, and everybody looks at way too many numbers. And when you show people your numbers, it's just one of many. But what I've found throughout my career is if you can get very, 
very focused on what your story is. And you keep telling that story over and over and over and over and over again. That people suddenly get familiar with the characters. They get invested in that struggle. And finally, they want to know how they can help and write a happy ending. Thank you. I have prepared and analyzed and prepared like so much data in my career that I've wasted actually so many people's time because it was very poorly presented, it had no story, and I just felt like I've taken a lot of time away from this world. And I want to give that time back to the world by hoping that you will all take this message to heart. So definitely connect with me all things around data, analytics, product management, or even better, AI products. I love AI products. Or building a fulfilling career. I made a pretty drastic uh, change in my own career, and if you're looking to do that, I would love to connect with you as well. So thank you again, everyone. I hope this talk is valuable, and I hope to hear how it has changed your life. Thank you. Okay, questions? Okay, we got one. <laughs> what was the, you said you had a big career change. What, what was the career change that you, you went through to get to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, so I mentioned I was an engineer in oil and gas, so I was a production engineer, hence why I was talking a little bit about getting oil to the ground. And that was all I did, right? I was just trying to figure out how we turn peanut butter into water, essentially. How do we get out of the ground easily? And then the pandemic happened, and I was like, okay, what do I want to do with my career next? And I have now changed into digital banking products. So that app that you use on your phone to pay your bills, right? I look at all those numbers, and now I try to figure out how do we uh, yeah, improve the product, right? But again, um, you know, between oil and gas, banking, I found like the storytelling of the story. Um, the data is kind of linked between the two. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the, for, the, for the talk today. I think the lack of questions just speaks of how well you presented, I'll be honest. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so my question is this. So, in, I think, you know, you, your point of the presentation is such an amazing topic because we can all focus on the technology, but if we don't, we're not able to communicate what that technology is telling us. We can't really make an impact. And my question to you is, maybe you can give us a, uh, an example from your past experience when you realized that that was valuable. Like maybe uh, an anecdote from your career when you realized like, oh, I, you know, everything I'm doing with this technology is about telling stories. When did that happen in your life? Yeah, um, actually, so, so I guess with, my, with the apps that we're building, right, um, one of the things I find is when we present the data on our app that we just have so many metrics, right? So we show people, hey, look at all these numbers. Look how cool it all looks, right? Look at all these numbers. But I find that when you do that, everyone's like, oh, cool, that's a lot of numbers. And, I don't know what to do with it, right? So what I found is you really need to find that focus on that one number, right? And what is that one impactful number that you want people to care about? And this is the number that you, don't, you do not only just tell it once, but you do it, do it again next week, next month, next quarter, same number, same number, over and over. It will be different, but then you can tell that story of how that number is changing, right? And I think that is how you actually get people now invested inside your number. Thanks for your presentation. Um, it's actually, you know, if you want to offer the, those who are in the, in the industry or in the academia, particularly the engaging in the data science, I, I, I definitely agree that it's necessary to tell about storytelling anything they actually engage in. Um, so, and also, you know, you know, the, yeah, so actually the, I, I was actually, I, to, I totally overlooked the 
how really matter for the Matrix part. So it was a very, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it was a really inspiring. My question is, um, particularly if the maybe let's say that uh, if some students want to actually pursue the data, the data, data science, or for the some junior level employees are actually like a, a developing their careers. Um, could you actually tell any suggestions for how to actually develop kind of some storytelling in the in their area for the world where they actually analyze the data and and of course you know the part of the challenges on using the mat matrix is sometimes when they also so in the in the context of the machine learning there might be some somewhat like some some number of the metrics will be also correlated with each other so you can also maybe if, if you also if, if you actually have any any idea how to actually deal with some high correlation of the metrics uh, to dealing with some statistical modeling or the machine learning yeah and kind of like i mentioned before like if you're in the business of like ai and machine learning um you know like i mentioned that measure doesn't usually lie within that data, right? Your impact or your story is bigger than that. And what I liked about this previous talk was she started off with why computer imaging is important for medical industry, right? Things like, like reduction in cost, right? Saving more lives. And I think if you're kind of working with a lot of data, um, you know, stepping out of that and looking for other types of data, right? Like, how long does it take for a doctor to do this certain procedure, right? And when you step outside of your own data and start looking at more impactful data on the world, I think that's where you can start telling a bigger story on your AI projects. Like whether whether you are explaining your insights to customers or product managers or business people, you'll you also need some feedback as well so that you know get, you know, that they, they understood the, the insight that you are trying to tell and not sleeping because it was Saturday morning. <laughs> any, any suggestion for that? Um, I think trying to make your stuff more relatable. I, I think whenever I give talks about talks or talking about data, I always need to build that relationship first, right? And think about what do they actually care about? And I think that in anything, whether you're like in a relationship, or you're trying to communicate data, or you're giving a talk on how to give data talks, it's, it's all about making that connection first, right? Whether it's with your audience, uh, clients, your manager, etc. Et um, and I, I think it all just starts with that. Okay, so anyways, I'm about to get off, so thank you everyone.